The Catholic Health Association wants you to know that Medicaid makes it possible for one in five Americans to access health care. Hi, I'm Father Jim Martin. Welcome to Faith in Focus. This show is all about faith, what faith means to you, and how you live your faith every day. In this month's episode, we'll look at what's been going on at the Vatican's Synod on Young People that recently wrapped up in Rome. After that, we have an interview with Stephen Colbert. We shot this interview back in March when we were still planning Faith and Focus, so the set may look a little different from the rest of the show. But we're very excited to share that conversation with you. In our People of God segment, we'll hear from Melissa, a remarkable young woman doing social justice work with a women's theology group. Then my friend and colleague Ashley McKinless, associate editor at America Media, joins us for some holy humor from St. John the 23rd. Thanks so much for joining us. We hope you enjoy Faith and Focus. Last month, the Synod on Young People, the Faith, and Vocational Discernment, which was convened by Pope Francis, wrapped up in Rome. A synod is a type of gathering, usually of bishops, which came into greater prominence after the Second Vatican Council in the 1960s as a way to help the Church reflect on a particular issue. The Synod on Youth, which met from October 3rd to the 28th, gathered bishops and young people, along with many other experts, to discuss issues related to the Church's outreach to youth. It was easy to keep up with the proceedings since every day at the press conferences run by the Holy See Press Office, a select number of bishops, priests, religious, and lay people would report on what had happened the day before and answer questions. So it was a quite open process. In the end, the Synod voted on and issued a final document summing up its conclusions. The most notable development was a deepening appreciation of what's called synodality, that is, a reliance on synods just like this one to help the church listen to Catholics and to help the church make better decisions. That marks a considerable shift from a church that has been for many centuries top down. Second, the bishops said they developed a greater appreciation of the complexity of the lives of young people from around the world. Many of the bishops said how important it was not to just talk about young people or talk to them, but listen to them and really be challenged. Third, there were some controversial issues that revealed some tensions within the church. For example, LGBT issues. In the end, the final document praised the value of accompanying LGBT people and admitted that the church had much to learn about them. But thanks to some opposition from some bishops from the U.S. and Africa, the Synod decided not to use the term LGBT. So, a global church that's still in many ways on the way. For more about the Synod, and what it means for the future of the church, check out our extensive coverage at americamagazine.org. Thank you for watching Faith in Focus. This series is made possible by generous donors. To give your support or learn more about how you can join the conversation around faith and culture, visit americamag.org slash faithshow. Stephen is very generous. He is constantly bringing a sense of joy um, and inviting anyone who watches him to share in that joy. He also creates a wonderful family of people who want to be together and who want to work together. And that community is what makes the show so great. I would not want to work for anyone else. I was a student at Fordham University. At the beginning of our senior year, they were hosting an event which was going to be this conversation between Stephen Colbert and Cardinal Dolan about the intersection of faith and humor, moderated by Father Martin. And as a big fan of the rapport, I did a little 30 second animation to introduce that night. And as a result of that animation, I got to meet Stephen, and then he invited me to come meet his graphics team at the Colbert Rapport. That turned into an internship, and that internship then turned into a job at the Rapport, which then turned into a job at the Late Show, which then turned into Donald Trump as president. It's one thing to go out as a late night comedian and do setup and punchline. It's another thing to have a real moral component. Doing nothing is cowardice. Doing something 
will take courage. It's important, I think, to the staff and to Stephen to call out what they see as destructive behavior. I think we can agree that this has been an absolutely exhausting, bruising election for everyone. That's right. The election night 2016 had started off with one idea of how the night would turn out and in the middle of the live event turned into what many have described as a wake. Grief is rare for comedians, but I see that as a component of his faith, that he engages fully with all aspects of being a human and can use that to bring people together. Now please, get out there, kiss a Democrat, Go hug a Republican. There is a, an element of humility um, that is central to faith, which I also think is central to any good comedian. For many people in my generation, faith has sort of uh, gone out of style to a certain extent, um, and it's viewed with a certain skepticism. So to see someone at the level of celebrity that Stephen is and the just level of um, intelligence and passion, I think, is an inspiration to anyone who um, wants to do the same. Today I'm pleased to welcome an old friend to the show. I'm proud to introduce the official chaplain of Faith and Focus, <laughs> <laughs> Stephen Colbert. I'm honored. I'm welcome. honored. Yeah, wow. welcome. Yeah, th those are very august responsibilities. Thank you too. very much. Yeah. I do have one of those certificates you can order online okay. to marry people mm -hmm. in the state of New York. So, oh, you know, yeah. I know you went to seminary, but yeah. I, I went online. Mm -hmm. Send us the bill. Send us the bill. You got it. Uh, thanks for taking out the time. I appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure. I always like talking to you, Jim. How's the, uh, how's the show going? Uh, well, I, I, I mean, CBS is happy because mm -hmm. the ratings are good. I mean, on that, on that level, like them, the, the business end is just fine. The, You're number one, right? We are. We are. Mazel we are. tov. Thank you very much, yeah. as, as we say That's right. in comedy. <laughs> the process of doing the show is an ongoing thing. Because I've talked to you about this before. There's 51% of the show that the audience sees, you know, which gives me the joy to do the show for the audience. But then there's the 49% that they don't see, mm -hmm. which is how we got there during mm -hmm. the day. And that's an ongoing thing. Um, now, you, you spoke about joy. You used to call the old show the Joy Factory, right? Joy Machine. Joy Machine. Because it's always a machine. And unless you put some joy in it, um, it'll grind you down. You'll get your, you'll get your tie caught in and get sucked through the gears. Is the new show a joy machine too? Or do you have a different It can be. It? It's, it's a funny thing is that I, I, the mechanics of my show are explained to me in some ways more than they are actually run by me. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have uh, Tom Purcell, who's my creative exec, and I have Chris Licht, who is my uh, showrunner, the guy who basically keeps everybody in their lanes and keeps us pointed in the right direction. They'd know if it's a joy machine. It's a joy for me. Well, that's good. Well, because it, at it, least someone's it, getting joy out I, of it. It's right? a great joy for me. Uh, is it harder to sort of convey joy and hope to the audience in these, shall we say, difficult times? Well, it might be hard, but it's yeah, all the more important. Like right after the the election last year, I haven't made any secret of my feelings. But right after the election last year, I walked out the next week, or then maybe the next day, to do the show after election day, and I realized how happy I was to be there. Mm -hmm. Because what I, what, what I needed was a sense of community and people who agreed with me that this was crazy mm -hmm. and <laughs> that we're not crazy for thinking that something's wrong. Like, you know, what do you want to be? Not alone, yeah. you know? And people say, what is the success of one of these shows? And I think above anything else is creating a sense of community. We had that with the old show, The Colbert Rapport. Mm -hmm. Our double joke was like rapport, like the rapport, and then the rapport you have with the audience. I called them the it-getters. Mm -hmm. You're the heroes because you get it, whatever it was, was mm -hmm. my argument of the day. But on the new show, we're saying that about reality. Right. You're being gaslighted mm. by people who are heretics against reality, is what I've called them. Mm -hmm. Is that I was taught like heresy was the worst sin because not only are you sinning, but you're dragging, seducing other people into your sinful ways. Right. I talked about truthiness a lot on the old show, meaning that which you feel to be true regardless of what the facts would support, which is a common political thing that we just gave a name to. But now we've moved into something new, which is you're indifferent as to what the truth is. You just name a truth even if it has no relationship to the fact, and you can name it differently the next day. It's a, it's a far greater and far more... 
I think, um, malicious because it is purely selfish, unmooring from reality. And so that's why I think that the, 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 our leaders in Washington right now, specifically those who are supporting the president, um, who should know better are heretics against reality because they're trying to convince you that you're wrong, that this is normal. Now, you, you brought up uh, sort of the moral theological questions. You have a lot of Catholicism in the new show. I shouldn't say new. I mean, I mean it's, it, oh, yes, yeah, two plus years yeah, old. Yeah, Midnight but... Confessions and Talking to God. <laughs> right. I was curious, was that uh, hard to convince the network of, or were they that you... They, they mostly leave us alone. If, I, okay. if, I, if, if, if God doesn't come on and say, don't eat McDonald's, I think we're fine. <laughs> <laughs> Has God said that to you in any sort of uh, prayer experiences you've had, or no, not yet? No, yeah, God no, would never say something. No, like that. on in go for the fillet of fish. Right, right, That's the only right. Thing he said. Uh, he said. Speaking of which, yeah. uh, let's talk a little bit about your faith, which you've not been embarrassed to talk about. I'm not going to ask too. No, I'm, I'm, in, I'm embarrassed by the limitations of oh. my ability to talk about it. But that, but that's about it. Uh, who is God for you? Like when you think about God, what's your image? People have different images. Uh, it's Christ. It's it's Jesus. It's mm -hmm. not it's so not the beard. Okay. It's not the it's not the it's not the old man right. with the beard. It's not uh, the Old Testament God. As soon as I imagine a, a God, if you're really looking for literal imagery, like sure. what I think of, yeah. I think of God. I think of Jesus, and then that image dissolves because I then try to subsume that single image into the Trinity. Okay. And and then it just becomes. Um, a bit of like one of those amorphous all creatures made of pure energy from Star yeah. Trek, mm -hmm. you know. Which um, is fine. It, it's like um, there's a trick. I often try to convince myself um, that the world is different than it is in, in this way. Here's a strange thing. I used to do this exercise all the time when I was younger. Um, uh, let's say I'm a cafeteria in college. I'd pick up a piece of broccoli and hold it up. And then I would look at it and I would suspend my knowledge that if I let go, it goes this way. And to see whether I don't know which way it would go. That maybe even convince myself it would go that way. And I would let go. And if it will fall down. And if, it, if I thought it was funny that it went down, I'd go like, oh, I did it. I managed to suspend my uh, gravitocentric view of my existence that gravity would take it down that way. I feel the same way when I try to imagine God. Like when I pray, my habitual prayer is among whatever... Um, intentions I may have in my prayer or what I might offer up, I always ask for the ability to love because then if I can love, I'll be free. And as I love you, Lord, let this be. That's, mm -hmm. that's, that's sort of how I end every prayer, like after communion. Okay. Um, and when I think of love, I think of God. God is, love is the every only God who breathed this world so glad and big that even the thing all small and sad, man, his, may his mighty briefness dig. Um, Who is that, by the way? Who that's E.E. E. Cummings. Okay, beautiful. Um, I thank you, God, for most of this amazing day. And uh, and so when I when I think of God and I think of love, and when I think of love, I think of God. So when I say that aspect of my that that ending to my personal prayer, ooh, God is opening and upward. Mm -hmm. I, that image of love, let me love. What I'm imagining is some triune opening, like a bay door that has three three leaves to it opening mm -hmm. up and through which I can go and on the other side of that is freedom and that has to do with love and acceptance mm -hmm. that's you beautiful know? God is opening and upward God is, is opening comments. and upward that's beautiful and uh, you spend a lot of time with the gospels are they like in terms of I don't spend a lot of time with, I don't spend a lot of time with the gospels I mean I, I have over the years I, I always carry with me I don't know it's been transferred in my new bag someone on a bus in Chicago I've, I've got, I, I received two New Testament Proverbs and Psalms without expecting it when I was younger. One of the Gideon gave it to me on the street. I think I've mm -hmm. told you the story before where I just, it was so cold I had to crack it open because it had frozen, sort of shut no, the tell humidity. Us the, tell I was walking down the street in Chicago and there was just somebody, I was anxious. We reached and graduated. How, how old are you? I'm 22. Yeah. And uh, so just 10 years ago. Yeah, exactly. Right, right. Yeah. And I had, um, I had been. Ah, picking my liver and, and was sort of convicted of my own atheism and uh, had lost my faith in God and uh, to my own great grief that I, w I, was, I was sort of convinced that I would, had been wrong all this time, that I'd been taught something that wasn't true. And I was walking down the street and someone handed me a little green, I still have it oh, someplace. Oh yeah, those little ones. Little yeah. green New Testament Proverbs and Psalms. And uh, it, was, it, it was 
it must have been humid and then brought out into the cold because mm -hmm. it was frozen. You had to like kind of snap it. It was really, really cold Chicago day. And I opened it up and I opened it up to a little glossary in the front and it said basically verses to read based upon like if you, right. and it says anxiety. Worry, yeah. So I went to anxiety and it was, it was Matthew chapter five. It was the sermon. And so I say, do you do not worry for who among you by worrying could change a single hair in his head or add a cubit to the span of his life. And, and I was absolutely immediately um, uh, lightened. And for the first time, I understood the real meaning of the phrase, it spoke to me. Like it read off the page, like the mm. words of Christ just read off the page. Mm -hmm. It was no effort. And then I, I stood on that street corner in the cold and read the sermon. That's and beautiful. my life has never been the same. Uh, this gift of religion is something that can only be given in this way. Whatever the parent is trying to give, sure. whatever the ancestor is trying to give you, can only be given in this way. I, I used to, and, and therefore you should be humble and accept this act of love and and see what it is they gave you without rejecting mm -hmm. it. Because it's, it, it's very, I want to say easy, but it's common for young people to reject everything sure. that came before them because how could that be right? That could be right. Well, to say nothing of baptism. I mean, you know, God himself calls you into the, to the faith, so there's that too. And I thought, oh, well, that is the gift of Catholicism my, of my ancestors mm, to me. That's beautiful. It is a sacred fruit. They are giving me this gift, and it would be unloving not to receive it and see what they tried to give me. Mm. So, Well, and it's beautiful. I mean, that, that, that image of you standing on the corner, I mean, the whole metaphor of the, the Gospels being frozen and needing to be cracked open is mm. also very powerful. Oh, I had thought about that. Well, I want to say thank you for sharing your faith with us here on Faith and Focus. Um, we're that. very grateful that you could come by today oh. and uh, hope we see you again. Thanks. I hope you enjoyed our interview with Stephen Colbert. Up next, we'll hear from a remarkable young woman about how her conversion to Catholicism inspires her to work for social justice and women's rights. Stay with us. Our next segment is called People of God. In it, we'll hear from Catholics from around the world about a grace-filled moment that changed their lives. Today on People of God, we're talking on Skype with Melissa Cedillo. Melissa lives in Washington, D.C. and is a fellow with WATER, the Woman's Alliance for Theology, Ethics, and Ritual, where, according to her, she does a little of everything. Welcome to the show, Melissa. Hi. Nice to have you with us. Thank you for having me. You, uh, you converted to Catholicism when you were in high school. Can you tell us a little bit about what uh, drew you first to the faith? Yeah, so I think the first part was just the way that my teachers were living out their life, I think was very inspirational. And the more I asked questions about it, the more they explained that it was rooted in their idea of faith. And I think as I sat in a lot of those cla uh, qu classes and kind of discerned and wrestled with a lot of those questions, I really was just drawn to the intellectual portion of it, but also watching the way my teachers were living out their lives was also really inspirational, and I wanted to be a part of that. What was it like uh, receiving the sacraments for the first time? What was the whole process like for you? Um, it was incredibly intimate and beautiful, and I think, like I said, it was the intellectual part that drew me into the church. And so I think that moment of receiving the oil and knowing that my sponsor had gone through the same thing and we both had chose to be there and it was just such a beautiful um, moment and all of my family was there and my friends were there and it was this idea of being in communion and it was this idea of everything I have learned coming to life um, and it was so special. So would you say that you experienced God mainly through relationships, is that right? Oh yeah, I think I mean, the nerd in me um, feels it when I'm in the classroom and I'm really diving into theology and we're going back and forth and I'm hearing those perspectives, but also that relationship, like I said, with my sponsor in the sacraments. But yeah, definitely in the relationships in my life, I really see that. Well, now that you're out of college and, uh, you know, in your first job uh, with water, how do you hold on to those uh, sort of initial moments, uh, the kind of really powerful moments uh, to take you through day-to-day uh, -day life? What, what, do you have any advice to people? <laughs> um, for me, I think the one word that comes to mind is humor. Um, I really imagine God in sort of a comedian, sort of that motherly notion where your mom knows you best and is usually right if you just listen to her in the first place, but you think you know better type thing. That's a great image of God. So kind of a playful God that is kind of uh, willing to let Melissa 
kind of do something wrong, but then forgive her and maybe <laughs> kind of laugh about it with you? Is that the idea? Yeah, that's at least what I, I, I feel. I usually, when something happens, I kind of smirk and I'm like, I know, I know, I'm not in control. And I tried again and I'm, I'm sorry, I should have listened. <laughs> well, it's great because, I mean, that's the way Jesus was with the disciples. I mean, he's putting up with the disciples, you know, as we all do, making mistakes and always forgiving them. So that's, that's a great image of God. Um, well, I just want to thank you for, for being with us, and, uh, and we hope uh, everything goes well with you at Water. Of course. Thank you so much. So thanks again to Melissa uh, for sharing her story and her faith with us today. If you have a story to share about a moment God touched your life, send us an email at fifshow at americamedia.org. Today we're wrapping up the show with a new segment called My Life with the Saints. Joining me is Ashley McKinless, Associate Editor at America Media and co-host, as you probably know, of Jesuitical, a great podcast for young Catholics. Hey Jim, thanks for having me on. Our pleasure. Today we are talking about St. John the 23rd, also known as Good Pope John. You probably know John the 23rd as the Pope who convened the Second Vatican Council. He's also remembered as a caring and pastoral shepherd and a strong advocate for peace. After living through both world wars, he helped with behind-the-scene negotiations during the Cuban Missile Crisis and urged Catholics to be peacemakers in his encyclical Pachamenteris, or Peace on Earth. John XXIII, Ashley, was well known among both Catholics and non-Catholics. A Jesuit friend of mine uh, told me that he was in a taxi cab when the news of John XXIII's death came over the radio, and the taxi cab driver teared up, he said, and turned to him and said, I'm not Catholic, but he was our Pope, too. And now he's our saint. In 2014, Pope Francis canonized Pope John alongside another beloved Pope, John Paul II. And one reason why John XXIII is so well-loved in the church is because he had a terrific sense of humor. Uh, my favorite joke that I've heard about him is a, a journalist came up to him and asked him, so how many people work at the Vatican? And John thought for a second and then responded, about half. Yeah, I'm sure they love that in the Vatican, probably still today. Uh, one of my favorite jokes, Ashley, is uh, John the 23rd uh, was at the Hospital of the Holy Spirit in Rome, and the sister in charge ran up to him and said, Holy Father, welcome. I am the superior of the Holy Spirit. And he said, well, then you outrank me. I'm only the vicar of Christ. <laughs> I first heard that joke in a silent retreat house and laughed out loud when I read it. I'm sure the other retreatants appreciated yes, that. Yes, they did not. <laughs> so, Ashley, thanks so much for joining us. and. Um, Congratulations on the success of Jesuitical. We hope that everyone listens to Jesuitical, our wonderful podcast with Olga Segura and Zach Davis. Thank you so much for having me on. Pleasure. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Faith in Focus. To learn more about the show or to support Faith in Focus and share your faith story, visit americamag.org slash faithshow. We'll have a new episode next month with one of my favorite journalists, Krista Tippett. See you there. Thank you for watching Faith in Focus. You can find more videos like this on our YouTube channel and subscribe so you never miss an episode. To learn more about how you can have your story featured on the show, visit americamag.org slash faithshow.